Hello everyone, and welcome to the 26th in our ongoing series of lectures on Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics. Today we will be covering questions. What kind of questions are there? What do we do when we encounter a question? How can we tell if something is a question at all? That is what we are going to be looking at today. So there are two core types of questions in Middle Egyptian and I should say in most languages. First of all, you have your yes or no questions. Uh, and then you have open-ended questions where you're asking for in, you know, filling in the blank of a particular information. And in English, as in many other languages, these are grammatically differentiated between something like, did you see him? And whom did you see? The former is just asking if something is true or false. The latter is asking to fill in a substantial amount of information and any number of answers could be given to it. So in Egyptian, yes, no questions are marked quite simply by using a question particle. You'll note in English, we also don't do very much to mark a yes or no question. We tend to just flip around the word order a little. Uh, in Egyptian, they did not do that. Uh, their verbal system wouldn't really permit it anyway, but that's simply not what they chose to do. They had a set of words that would turn a normal sentence into a yes or no question sentence. They just stuck either the word yin or the word yin yu at the beginning and left the rest of the sentence unchanged. Seems simple enough. Well, the problem is that you have to be able to tell the difference between yin and yin yu. And there's a lot of types of sentences that start with you already. So if you put a yin in front of that, it looks a lot like yin yu. So what are you supposed to do to figure out which one is meant? The short answer to that question is that if the original sentence could not have contained you, uh, if you know, your reconstruction does not permit it or there's some grammatical reason that it would never have it, then you're dealing with a yin you if you see a you there anyway. There are some other cases that are a little more complicated, but those are the definite ones. The longer answer is that yin can go before any kind of sentence, but yin yu can only precede a couple of sentence types. So it really is going to come down to how you are analyzing the following sentence, what verb form you think is there, what the general structure of the sentence is. And this is what makes that important uh, because knowing that both of these particles are options and being able to distinguish them is key to understanding what sentence you are dealing with and correctly translating it. It's also important for dating. Yin Yu is something of a late Egyptianism. It exists in Middle Egyptian, but it's not super common. The later into Middle Egyptian you get, as you get into the late Middle Kingdom, into the early New Kingdom in the 18th dynasty, the more Yin Yu's you're going to see until in late Egyptian Yin Yu becomes your normal scent, your normal question particle. It's very important, therefore, to be able to differentiate them also so that you can date a text. Yin Yu can only precede a couple of sentence types, particular nominal sentences. So your AB or your A Pu type nominal sentences uh, that we recently went over, and a little further back in terms of what we talked about, but your emphatic verbal sentences or your second tense sentences are really nominal sentences and can therefore take yin yu. Uh, these types of sentences, as you know, in both cases, they're never preceded by you. So if you see a, a yin plus a yu, you know it has to be yin yu. It's also possible that yin yu is used in Middle Egyptian for sentences with adverbial predicates. There is some debate on this, on whether the examples that have been found actually represent this phenomenon or whether they're uh, kind of ambiguous or late Egyptian, uh, you know, much further down the line as examples where we know that yin yu is just a normal question particle. It's kind of unclear. If you're interested in this, or indeed, if you're interested on reading like fully 100 pages on the distinguishing features between yin and yin yu, uh, my own advisor, David Silverman, wrote a comprehensive overview of the topic some time ago which I do recommend you read if you really want to dive in this question. By no means, by no means is this mandatory reading, 
But if you have access to like a library that has a good selection of Egyptological books, and you're intrigued by these questions and want to make sure you totally get all your part, all your question particles right forever, read that book. Uh, but I, I digress. Oh, and there, there's one other case for Yin Yu, which is any negation of a sentence type that can be used with Yin Yu is also going to be allowed to have a Yin Yu. Now, Yin Yu is not mandatory in these cases. In all of them, we have perfectly good Middle Egyptian sentences just with Yin. But Yin Yu can show up, and therefore it is important to know that it might. So let's go through a few examples, short ones, of some questions, how, how they might work. So here we have Yin Yu, E E N Et Er Hejet F. Now we have Yin, we know it's a question. Or at least the Yin at the start of a sentence, so we know it's a question. There are Yin. I know it has other uses, We've gone over some of them, we will in the future go over some others, uh, but if you see it right at the start of a full sentence, it's a question. And then we see a U. Maybe this is yin U, and maybe it isn't. I mean, there's a thing at the top saying that it is a yin U, but if you counter this in a text, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And then we see E, E, N, et. T is the second person feminine Singular suffix pronoun. That's a good, perfectly good subject for a verb. We know ee is a verb meaning to come. So it looks like we have a sedgem f of ee and et. But ee is a verb of motion. There's no circumstantial form of those, you know, not, not your typical main verb, that can take a sedgem and f. That's only allowed in an emphatic. And emphatic sentences can't start with you. So we must be dealing with a yin yu. We can now answer our question. This is yin yu, e and et. And the rest of the sentence is er hajet f. Uh, incidentally, er hajet f, so it's an r plus infinitive construction. Hedgy is a verb meaning to injure. Uh, so er hajet f, r plus infinitive plus suffix, in order to injure him. Have you come in order to injure him? Uh, with that sedge of NF, you know, making a perfect second tense, the, the past tense, have you come, uh, and the, uh, the R plus infinitive reading that in order to injure him. Here's another one without a verb. Uh, we have yin and then you. So again, maybe you have a yin you, maybe you have a yin and then a regular you beginning sentence. Uh, kesnet uh, means like injury or harm or badness. A lot of very negative sentences today in the, uh, not the negation sense, but simply in the to difficult topic sense. And then poo. Uh, poo, you probably remember from our previous non-example video, means it is. Uh, we know we're dealing with a question, so is it. But we also know something else about poo. It doesn't play well with you. If you see a poo, you want it to be in an AB type nominal sentence or an A poo B nominal sentence. No, uh, no use permitted. So we know it has to be a yin you. And we know that yin you can go before an AB nominal sentence. That's perfectly allowed. So without the question part, this is, is it a harm, an injury, something like that? With the in you, or sorry, it, it is a harm or an injury, and then with the in you, it becomes, is it a harm? Is it an injury? As a question. You can, of course, also get yin, no you, just in front of a, a regular sentence. Uh, so this one is yin pened n e chen. M Geb M Renech Het. Now, I have reconstructed this word Hened here. Uh, that's why the asterisk is, because I don't actually, I could not find a good spelling for it. This is like a, a slightly strange word. Um, it, I think it shows up a couple times in like coffin text, but it's not show up in Falker's dictionary. It's not very common. Uh, but for 
our purpose is, uh, the point is not trying to elucidate its exact meaning. I think it's something like replenish or, or nourish or something like that. Um, the, the, there's an entire article explaining this verb that is not the point of the video. The point is the form of the verb. Uh, this, you'll see there's no you, but it's right at the front. So we're dealing with either a perspective or a second tense. Uh, and then if we continue down the sentence, uh, we see uh, em we see something that we could uh, emphasize. M Renech pet. Uh, that is an, a prepositional phrase. So no you good prepositional phrase to emphasize, probably we're dealing with a second tense. So take, removing the in, just taking this as a regular sentence, uh, it is something like, I nourish you, Chen for you, M Geb, as Geb, M Renech Pet, in your name of heaven. Kind of an odd sentence. This is from one of those religious texts of the Old and Middle Kingdoms. They have a lot of sentences like this. What a weird, difficult to parse stuff going on deeply intertwined with Egyptian religion. But the yin makes it a question. So is it in your name of heaven that I nourish you as geb? Or nourished, I suppose, with the end. That's the, the basic meaning of it. The point is here, yin can sit in front of a a second tense form, just like in you can, both of them perfectly valid in that scenario. You could also get in plus you, uh, as I have mentioned somewhat unfortunately. So here we have yin, you, seruch, en, ek, awi, or ait, I think. It's a better pronunciation. So yin makes a question, you. It's a little ambiguous. Uh, ser seruch means to, to raise or lift up. Uh, and then we have enek, uh, which probably best understood as a sejim nf form. Seruch enek. And then ait, arms, two arms specifically. Uh, again, I, I don't have a hieroglyphic reference for this, just the text, so the spelling of Vite might be a little different in the original text, but it's close enough. Here we have an initial sedge of NF, but there's nothing to emphasize. This isn't an emphatic form, and you wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to have a perspective here in a question, um, so sort of a would you, especially with an N, I don't think it works. It, it kind of, the whole thing kind of falls apart if you try to make this a perspective. I think you want the U here to be the marker of the beginning of the statement of fact. So the core sentence is you seruf enek ait. You raised the arms. It's a question. Did you raise the arms? All right, great. Simple enough. You can also get these sort of questions of existence. They're not really a separate category, but they come up a decent amount. Um, in English, we'd say something like, is there or are there? In Egyptian, the general idiom is to use you when. Uh, remember, when means to be, but mostly in the sense of to exist, and then to turn that into a question. You when remu means there are fish. Fish exist. So then yin yu wen remu means are there fish? Uh, or I suppose do fish exist? Though it's pretty obvious that fish exist to like anyone. Uh, I think basically always when you're dealing with these when existential sentences, there is is almost always better. Uh, because when you say are there fish, you could easily be talking about a circumstance like you know, I'm go we're going, we're heading over to the lake. Are there fish, or haven't they stocked it yet? Or I, uh, I went to the market. Oh, are there fish there, or have they sold out? Those are reasonable questions. Fish obviously exist. 
uh, that's a kind of a translational note. You can also end up with some additional particles thrown into questions. Uh, in earlier periods, the main particle, this purpose is rare. Later you get ref. Uh, they both kind of mean then. You place them after the yin, immediately after the yin, to get a rhetorical question. That is to say, a question whose answer is known to the speaker and the audience alike. The point is not to actually elucidate an answer, it's to make obvious the fact that everybody knows the answer. The particle terror gets used in the same situations. Outside of questions, it's a little tougher to parse. Uh, there is some confusion about what exactly it means. Uh, the, a lot of different authors have posited a lot of different answers. I'm not going to posit an answer here. But in questions, if it comes after yin, it marks a rhetorical question. That much is easy enough. So here we have a good rhetorical question. Yin ref, weresh rf, or weresh e rf. Weresh is a great verb. It means to do something all day. Uh, it means to just keep doing something over and over again. Uh, very useful for when you're frustrated. This comes from the eloquent peasant. Uh, the guy is complaining that he has to keep showing up in court. And he, so he says, Yin ref, weresh e er f. So weresh e er f is, I am doing it all day. Or I am spending all day er f at it. I'm doing it all day. Yin makes it a question. Haven't I been doing it all day? And Yin ref specifically marks that obviously he's been doing it all day. He's saying, I just talked to you four times. Haven't I been doing this all day? Now I have to go a fifth time. He's expressing his frustration. This is not the only circumstance where you'll get it. I also like this example because it illustrates that ref uh, can also be the prepositional phrase er plus f. And there's no difference in the writing, but it should be pretty clear which one is which. Just a thing to note. Open-ended questions work a lot like they are in English. Uh, frankly, I think they're a little easier to understand than the yes-no questions in Egyptian. There's less subtlety to them. Uh, so in English, our question pronouns are who, what, where, when, why, and how. And sometimes things like which. Uh, in, as used to be true in older versions of English, and is still true in German and a number of other languages. You can also make question words by combining a word that means something like what with a preposition. Uh, if you, you've read Shakespeare and you, you're familiar with like wherefore, that's what that is. You take a, a question pronoun and combine it with a preposition and it becomes for where. Uh, in German, this is still fully productive and works with almost all prepositions. In English, we don't use it anymore. But in Egyptian, uh, you can do this. You can take a preposition and put the word who or what afterwards, and it now it's a different question word. Uh, so the independent interrogative pronouns, i.e. the ones that, are, that exist without any helpers, uh, the big one is M. That means who or what. Uh, and this is kind of the dependent version. The independent version is peter or puter or something like that. Uh, so, you know, AB nominal sentences, you peter or puter. Uh, and any other circumstance, you're going to get M. Uh, M is the one that's coming after prepositions. On rare occasion, you'll also get uh, C or Ishet, uh, which also mean who or what. Uh, and then things like how or why, you get a preposition plus an interrogative. Uh, so me M is how. Her M, on account of what, is why. Uh, these, I'm not going to list them all out. You, they're going to be in the dictionary. Uh, if you see them, it's going to be pretty clear what's going on, that it is a question word that is combined with a preposition. Just be aware that that's something that can happen. Uh, one very important one comes up a lot is the participial statement version. Um, something like by whom or who will do it or something like that uh, is yin m. Uh, that, that This comes up a good bit. It, it fits exactly with our participial framework, except instead of a regular noun, specifically the proposition n. You may remember that you usually use independent pronouns in participial statements if you're going to use a pronoun, 
but m is the exception. It's the, use m instead of uh, pater or puter. So here is an example of kind of an A, B question. You have uh, pater or peti or any other of its various writings, ref, su. Now, you'll know, remember that with yin questions, ref marks a rhetorical question. This is not a rhetorical question. I know the context from this one comes from uh, the West Carver virus. Uh, it is not rhetorical. It's just a regular question. Um, at least I believe this is the West Carver virus, maybe another one of the narrative tales, but it is not, uh, it's not a rhetorical question. Uh, Peti ref su, who then is it? Uh, in these cases, ref really just does mean like then, its usual meaning. Uh, but your A part is peti, and your B part is a dependent pronoun, su, uh, which is what you expect in, you know, if you need a B position pronoun, it's the dependent series. Peti, ref, su, who then is it? You can also have, you know, of course, your participial question. This one is definitely from the West Carver Papyrus. Yin, ma, ref, ini, n, f, n, e, c. Ref, again, it's not right after a yin of asking a question, so it just means then. So yin ma means you're concerned with the doer of the following action. Who will do this, or who did this, or something like that. Who then, yin yi f n e c. Who then will bring it to me? Note the resumptive use of the F. Um, or per actually, perhaps this is better parsed as a, a set. No, yeah, this is a sedum T fee. Um, I apologize. That is not a resumptive. That is the uh, the future relative, or the future participle, the sedum T fee. Of course, you expect a participle in a, in a participial statement. So who then will bring it, said Jim T. Fee, though the neither Y's nor one of the T's is written, as is unfortunately common, will bring C, it, and E to me. So that's everything we have. This is not a super difficult topic. Uh, you probably won't need to you know, really drill this in your head like you do with some of the verb forms, but it is an important one to watch out for, especially with this yin, yin, yu distinction that can matter a lot for your analysis of underlying sentence patterns. The next video will be on negations. I might have to split it up into multiple parts uh, because negations is kind of a big topic. I do want to dedicate some serious time to it, especially negations of particular patterns of verbal sentences, which can get really intricate and is very important for certain kinds of translational work. Thank you.